performance. If you can't do that, I don't care if you can do a funny impersonation of those characters. Okay? Good. We got the baseball bat here and the grenade launcher. Everything's set. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's got another question for me? Yeah. Um, when you, when the Pokemon Orange Islands happened, um, did you have a little bit more free time since you just had to do James and not Brock? See, here's how it works when we work on all of these different seasons. You had breaks because they stopped airing each season and gave you a break. I look at the 10 years or so that I was working on that show as one long journey. We never stopped. There was no time off. When, we, when you didn't see it on the air, we were working on the next installment. We might have been dubbing a movie, we might have been working on something else. So I could not even tell you that there was ever any downtime, ever. I was working, I directed two episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh! a week. I directed two episodes of what other show I was working on at the same time. And then I was also dubbing shows as an actor. So 10 to 10 every day, I was in the studio doing something. Thank you for my childhood. Yeah, well, you're welcome. But it, so I don't remember the gaps in, in all of that stuff. It just was constant. Um, I don't even know the seasons by, you know, it's funny, Veronica Taylor, who played Ash, she knows more about the seat. She'll be like, well, that's the, the home league. And I'm like, I don't, I just remember we were trying to capture Pikachu all the time as Team Rocket and Brock saw a girl, you know? <laughs> I don't remember. You're like, remember when you battled this guy? No, I, I don't. Remember when you fought and used that card? Uh, no, I don't remember. Um, yeah. Can you do a voice for me? No, no, let's just keep doing the Q&A stuff. Okay. All right, who else got a question for me? Anybody else? Um, yeah, the Tour of the Leonard Skinner. Yeah, the Tour of the Leonard Skinner. Um, I, uh, I had been lucky enough to, um, uh, my managers sent uh, a tape, this was a while ago, to um, Ringo Starr, and he needed an opening act. So they picked me to open that tour. So I did like 26 days opening for Ringo and the All-Star Band, which was so much fun. Great, great band, great audience. And, and towards the very end of that tour, the Leonard Skinner people saw me open that show and came up to me and said, hey, in three days, when your tour is ended, we're going out on the road back across America, like I had gone from the West Coast all the way to New York, and the Skinner people said, we're starting here and going all the way back, or it's one way or the other, we're going all the way back to the same cities, and we need an opening act. Because I don't know if you know the um, singer Paul Rogers, you ever hear the band Bad Company? Yeah. So Paul was on that tour, and Paul didn't want to be the opening act. He needed someone to go on first. So they were like, he'd be good, let's get him to go on first, and then Paul could go on and then Skinner. So um, I went back across the states touring with Skinner, and that was, um, that was a tough gig. It was a lot of fun, but um, being able to, because I only play original music, so imagine you know, your hardcore fans for a band, and an opening act comes out, you already know you're gonna have to wait one more act before your, your, your favorite band comes on, and you've gotta give this guy 30 minutes or 40 minutes of music you don't know, because I only play original stuff. So that was truly um, trial by fire, but it was great, it was a great experience. Um, I feel like after both of those tours, because the Ringo tour was very, very family friendly, just, you know, the audience was pretty mellow. The Spinner fan was a little rough around the edges, but it was still a blast. I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was like an education. It taught me how to read an audience, how to, how to change the songs up. No, you know, could I get away with the ballad during that, in that tour? No. The Ringo tour, yeah, I could play that slower song, but the Spinner fans wanted to hear more of the rock stuff. And I was just still solo. So I think they also gave me a lot of credit, the audience. I think they figured, if this guy is brave enough to come up here in front of us, play 35 minutes, 40 minutes of his own music, we'll give him that, and we won't boo him off the stage. I think I only had one show where things got rough. They didn't boo me. They fought each other in the front row while I was playing. That was exciting. I was like, wow, these guys are killing each other. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. There was one show in Kansas where 
I look out and this uh, Skinner had big, big audiences. I look out into this field, uh, in the sea of faces, and at the, at the very back I can see flame flying back and forth, back and forth. And I was like, what is that? Turned out they were lighting pizza boxes on fire and throwing them as frisbees. Oh. Just for fun. Yeah. That didn't happen at the ring before. But anyway, yeah, that was a lot of fun. That's crazy. Somebody have a question that hasn't asked me a question yet? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I've been collecting Blowing Sweat Dragons for many years. Awesome. So I want to say that I, I, I blame you for me spending... Way too much money on. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry about that. You know, I, I, if it makes you feel any better, that money doesn't go to me. Okay. You know, it should go to Kyber Corp, which should then funnel down to me, but it doesn't. Um, yeah, you know, and of course that's my go-to car. There's better monsters. There's better, you know, stronger this and that. But that's like, you know, that's his go-to character. So uh, that's good. And there's some pretty cool ones. Did you buy? Did you get the new movie yet? You know, we're watching that tonight. Oh, I, I'm, nice. uh, I'm going to be in a, the production of Beauty and the Beast with in Harlingen, and this is opening night, and like, uh, I can't miss it. That's okay, but you saw the movie. Yeah. yeah. How long did it actually take you to, to design his hair? Kai's hair? To design, to design Yugi's hair. You said it took you, the hair took oh, you. Oh, yeah, 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 that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, what was nice about that, the, the, the lines in the new movie, you know, um, Sensei, the, the creator, came back and rewrote that. And he wrote that story, and we really tried to keep it pretty much uh, authentic in terms of like what their story was. There's a couple of obviously like you know inside jokes and stuff like that for the fans. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know what some of those original lines were. I mean, I know what some of my funny lines were, and I'm sure that they weren't written that way in the Japanese. But uh, yeah, that was funny about the hair. I don't know if that was in there. I doubt that Sensei was making fun of Yugi's hair in, his own, in the movie, but he liked it. He thought it was good. So, yes. Yeah. I was working on Slayers. Slayers was a lot of fun. For those of you who don't know Slayers, um, uh, it's, it's a great anime series. It's the first recurring role I ever played. I played Gallery on, on Slayers, and uh, my co-star, uh, Lisa Ortiz, plays Lena in verse, and the dynamic between the two of us is a lot of fun. She yells at me all the time. And, uh, and Gallery is kind of a uh, um, not-so-bright uh, gallant swordsman who um, I definitely was channeling Keanu Reeves when I was doing the voice for that. Uh, <laughs> but what was fun about working on Slayers was um, the scripts weren't always fully written on time for us to dub them. So a lot of times during the sessions, there's a lot of ad-libbing going on in that show. So. If there was lip lab and there wasn't a line written, we'd all, like the director and the engineer and I would look and go, hmm, what are we going to add here? What are we going to say here? So there's some wacky stuff thrown in there. Because remember, when you're working on a show that goes on the air, on network television, like Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh! People say, well, why did they change that? Why did they take the gun and turn it into a finger? Or why did they take this and change it back? You know, he's smoking a cigarette in this, so why did he change into a lollipop? And, and just to give you guys a little bit of an education on this stuff, every network has a department called ESP, and that stands for Broadcast Standards and Practices. And each network has their own list of what they consider acceptable for their network. Why? Because advertisers pay money to advertise on that network. If you offend a certain group of people, those advertisers won't advertise on your network and you lose money. So they dictate. You've seen certain networks might be more conservative, certain networks might be more liberal. You can tell what kind of shows and what kind of ads they have. Children's television has very, very strict rules. Very, very strict rules. So we had two networks that we were hearing shows on at the same time, the WB, it's WB, and Fox. Each network had their own person. There was no written rules of what they accepted and what they didn't. It was based on their own interpretation. So, if you saw a gun being pointed at someone's head for children's television on a Saturday morning, that had to be changed. Not from the production company. We didn't say we had to change it. We would present the show, they would read the script, they would look at the visuals, and they would say, change this line, cut that visual out, remove this. Have you guys ever seen repeated shots 
in anime? Yeah. 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 You know why that happens most of the time? Because they had to take something out. If you had to remove a five second shot because it was too violent, you got to go put five seconds back into that show. Not DVD versions, not straight to cable versions, but network television. The time of those shows is set. Every network half hour show is 20 minutes long, 10 minutes worth of commercials. You probably figured that out when you realized how many times we've got air commercials. So if you had to take time out from something, you'd have to add time back in. So use a repeated shot, hopefully not the same shot over and over and over. But that's why those things were changed. Now on a show also, so that means you can't really change the script once it's been approved by the BSP of each network. With a show like Slayers, it wasn't going to TV. It was going straight to video, which meant no one had to approve what I said. So there's some wild, wacky things in there. Not that they're inappropriate, but there's no, it's like, why did he even say that? What, you, know, you, you could change lines and ad-lib where you couldn't really do that on Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon and anything that was on network television. Just to give you guys a sense of where that, that kind of censorship comes from. Um, it doesn't come from the production company. Yeah. Did you have uh, fun uh, making, voicing set of Kaiba? Yes, Kaiba was, is, is one of my favorite characters to voice. Um, one of the reasons is um, when I was hired by Four Kids to, to be, to be the, the, the senior director there, they had that show. That was their anchor show. That was the big new show. And they showed it to me and said, this is what you're going to be working on. And I said, oh, well, this is going to be a huge hit. And they were like, yeah, no, everybody says that about every show we work on. I said, no, 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 this is like Pokemon 90210. It's like every, everything about Pokemon, you just gets a little bit more mature, same kind of format, characters that you can relate to, cool card game, all of that stuff, and um, I think this will be a big hit. The one character they hadn't cast yet, so all the other actors were cast for the first episode. Yugi, Tristan, Taya, Joey, right? Pegasus. Was Kaya. Now, if you know the first episode, which of course is really episode three, if you know the real story, um, it's all about Kaiba. So he hasn't been cast yet, but I was brought in as a director. And my producer on that show didn't really know me as a voice actor. He knew me as, oh, well, this is a guy that's worked on a lot of these shows, he's directed these other things, good, I've got this good director now working for me, because we had multiple shows going on. And so I didn't want to volunteer and say, hey, I should audition for this role because I'd be perfect for it. I'm the director, I don't need to double dip, as they call it. So we're casting, and we're casting, and we're trying to find Seto Kaiba. We're auditioning a lot of the people that you know, a lot of people outside of who you know, from, from all of our anime voice acting stuff. And my, my producer's saying the same thing to me over and over again. I'm not hearing what I'm looking for, I'm not hearing what I'm looking for. And then he would leave the room. And the engineer, who's a good friend of mine, who's worked with me for years, said, Eric, why don't you just tell him that you could play this role? You'd be perfect for it. I said, well, because I'm the director, and I don't think it'd be appropriate that, you know, my first day the, on the job, I go, hey, not only should I be the, the director of the show, but I should also be the co-star. Um, <laughs> so that took a long time. So finally, we were running ads that Yu-Gi-Oh! was going to be coming soon, right? This is not like straight to DVD. This was network television, so we had promos that would say, coming soon to the, you know, it's WB, it's you know. And I'm like, well, it's not going to be coming soon if we don't figure out who's going to play Seto Kaiba. So I said, fine, I'm going to mention it to my producer. I said to him, look, I said, I know that you think I play these wacky, fun characters on Pokemon, or, and we've never worked before as a voice actor and a producer, but I really think I know what you're looking for. Let me dub half the show. If you like it, we're halfway done and then we can get this on the air on time. If you don't like what I'm doing, we'll keep casting and try to, and try to scramble in the 11th hour. Say, fine, I don't even know what to do anymore. Just go ahead and try it. So I did it, he listened, and he was like, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I've been looking for. That's perfect, that's great, it's, it's gonna be awesome. And what I figured out with this character, and that's why I enjoy playing him so much, is Kaiba is not a villain, he's a rival. And the difference between villain and rival is the villain is a bad guy. Kaiba's not bad. 
if you know anything about the full story arc into the Egyptian side of all of this, Kaiba's role back then was that he was his lieutenant, his sparring partner. You can't be the champ if you don't have someone that pushes you to be the champ. Yugi needs me to keep him at the top of his game. Now, if you are in ancient Egypt, I can be someone's sparring partner. Right? Makes sense. Right? But if you're in modern day high school, how do you approach being someone's sparring partner without saying I'm your sparring partner? I have to approach it from a place of modern day realism, which is a rival. So the sarcastic barbs and the and the stuff that drives him crazy to just push him and push him to fight me to, is not because, yes, would Kaiba like to win? Yes. Does Kaiba know that he can never win? Yes. And that's the point. It's like Rocky and Apollo Creed, right? Push, push, push that champ to be the best. So playing that role is very, it, it's difficult because I never want to cross the line of being a villain. But of course we've all seen when the chips are down, which two people come together to fight a common enemy? The two of them. A villain wouldn't do that, right? So that's, that's why there's a lot of depth to that character and that's not that much of a phony voice that I use for my own. If you met me and I told you I played Seto Kaiba, you'd be like, oh yeah, I can hear it. I mean, because he's not that far away from my speaking voice. I mean, he's definitely a little lower and he has more sarcasm to it. But Yugi, that's just me, right? It's just me being a little bit more mature. And when fans tell me they hate Kaiba and the other fans tell me they want to be Kaiba, then I know I'm doing the right job. So it's a lot of fun to play that role. Plus, I mean, I told you I'm a big Batman fan. That's as close to Batman.